listen to them, children of the night, what music they make. Don't you dare touch me! Stand back! No! No! There have been numerous adaptations of this story with various degrees of sexy. From comics to anime, the Count has been featured in... everything. We've all seen and or heard someone donning a cape and doing their best Bell Lugosi impression. But what about the novel that launched a thousand films? Now for me, unlike Terry, I don't want to go over everything, every little detail in the novel. There's a lot of content, so I'm going to just kind of focus on the highlights, things that I think work, things that I find interesting, so forth. Firstly, the book is over 200 years old. It's going to have some dated aspects to it, and the sentences are going to be drawn out because when your options for entertainment are limited, you're going to make whatever you have last. There is sexism, Christianity is the bee's knees, don't you know? And there's a lot of classism. Be aware of that. Secondly, the story is not told in a linear format, meaning that while the story is chronological, for the most part, we are not following one character on a set path, we're following several characters on several different paths, and eventually they all converge. Through journals, letters, and the odd newspaper article, we learn about the characters and see how the story unfolds as time progresses. And they cling to their journals like someone in a found footage film clings to their camera and or smartphone. While it can get tedious and jarring jumping from different people in different locations, and it takes forever for anything to really happen, and this is coming from a vampire, it does contribute to the world building, and it does show the impact that Dracula is having on more than just one person at any given time, and how they are personally reacting to it. And, honestly, in their defense, if some weird shit's going down, you're going to want to record it. And they didn't have smartphones to capture it back then. I myself only recently got a smartphone, and it isn't even mine, it's Terry's. Jonathan Harker, for example, when he's in Dracula's castle, uses his journal as a coping mechanism as he is utterly isolated and knows of his impending death if he's unable to escape Dracula's castle. He's gonna die. If he doesn't escape, he's gonna die. If he escapes but he ends up, like, plummeting to his death, he dies. Either way, it's not looking too good for him. And he uses this journal to cope with everything. Another thing is Bram Stoker's attention to detail. None of the stories conflict with one another in their continuity. He did as much research as he possibly could and tries to ground his story in reality, even if he does take some creative license. He's a writer, that's what they do. One of the ways he did this is rather annoying, but admirable. He wrote people with accents. This can be difficult to get through as letters will be missing from words and sometimes whole words will be missing and there's old-fashioned terminology and then there's slang on top of that and there's cultural barriers. You can get through it, but it can be a pain in the ass. I kept hearing Dick Van Dyke from Mary Poppins in my head every time I came to one of these sections, but worse. However, only the working class and the poor people speak like this. Our more well-to-do, educated protagonist had more formal ways of speaking. Van Elsing also has an accent and little quirks to his speech. Little things like calling younger people than himself child, mixing some of the grammar due to the fact that he's German, um, always adding friend to his friend's name like, oh, friend John. Stuff like that. And this helps him stand out as a strong, unique character, which he is. He's one of the strongest and most unique characters in this book. He believes in the supernatural, and he believes in science, and he uses both to combat Dracula. He's odd, he's excitable, he's emotional, and he can be fun. If I were to be chased by a vampire hunter, I would like to have somebody like Van Helsing. Collectively, the main characters are basic and are meant to be just pillars of goodness. Be it delicate, sweet, loyal ladies, or brave, loyal, tough 
gentlemen. They're all pure Christian heroes. Now, while you can tell who is who, and each character has a role, some of them even have a profession, and they all contribute something to the plot by either being, like, a victim or a fighter, and in some cases both, it can be annoying to deal with so many characters. It adds to the bulk of the story and makes it drip like molasses when all you want them to do is just come together. Now what of Dracula himself? Well, his powers include super strength and speed, being able to summon wolves, transform into a large dog. N not that one. Turn into a mist that can escape any confines of any place he's put, the ability to mesmerize his victims, and, oh yeah, lucky fuck, though weakened during daylight hours, can still go out in daylight hours. Him and Carmilla both. However, he does have some weaknesses. He must sleep in boxes of his own native soil, which is why he brings 50 boxes of it to England, and he scatters them all over different locations so that he has numerous places to hide out. Pretty smart. I don't have to sleep in my native soil. I can sleep wherever, including on this couch, which I did earlier. Draw some curtains and uh, throw a blanket on. Fine. Uh, Christian symbols and items like crosses, holy water, wafers, all can repel and hurt him. Why? And garlic also repels him. And while he can go into places without being invited first, if he is in fact invited, he has all his powers. Whereas if he's not invited, he's weak. Despite these weaknesses, however, overall, pretty terrifying. He was once a powerful general centuries ago that led armies into victorious battle, so he is strategic, but he is also impulsive and petty, and there are some great scenes that showcase these traits. For example, Jonathan Harker, I mentioned him earlier. Well, he's one of the main characters. He's the one who really kicks this novel off. He's a solicitor that goes to Dracula's crumbling castle in Transylvania in order to help him finish some paperwork so he can purchase a crumbling abbey in England, really moving on up. Despite every mortal that Jonathan encounters telling him not to go to Dracula's castle, crossing themselves, offering prayers, one woman offering him a cross for his mother's sake, and even having his first carriage driver try to drive past the place that they were supposed to meet Dracula's carriage, so he can get Jonathan to the next town over, so Jonathan won't go to Dracula's castle. All of this, and Jonathan still goes, oh, you're just a bunch of superstitious nutjobs. Jonathan, you're religious. By your very nature, as a Christian, you too are superstitious, it's just in a different way. But man, with everything, with all of that, he's such a dumb bastard. I want dumb victims like that. There's no guilt in eating one of them. At first, everything seems fine when he gets to the castle, okay? The the Count's a little ugly, just, just ugly. Um, little odd that he's all by himself, you know? He claims that there's other people there, but it's clear that there, there isn't. Uh, but eventually, Jonathan starts seeing strange things, like uh, there's no reflection of Dracula in his shaving glass, even though the guy is right behind him. Yeah, we, we have reflections, just, just FYI. He also sees him crawling on the side of the wall of the castle like a spider. That happens. Uh, and he also never sees the Count outside of nighttime, and is explicitly warned to never wander the castle at night without him. Which, once Jonathan actually starts realizing some weird shit's going on, he decides he's going to start exploring, looking for a way out, just in case. And he accidentally falls asleep in this disused room, where he has to pretend to be asleep as three beautiful but very frightening women want to kiss him. And the Count having to intervene, claiming that Harker is his, and instead gives them a child to eat with the promise that once Harker is no longer of any use to him, they can have him. And when the mother comes pounding on the door of Castle Dracula, demanding her child back. Dracula sends a bunch of wolves to maul her, 
while Jonathan can hear it from his bedroom. From there, it's pretty obvious. Jonathan is fucked. Everything is locked up. He can't open the doors. He can't open the windows. There's no one around. And when he does try to get a letter out via some gypsies that happen to be around the castle helping Dracula move some boxes, which hey, he doesn't know what they are, but we find out what they are later, the letter ends up finding its way into Dracula's hands. So, well, but he has to pretend not to know what the Count is while the Count is fucking with him by pretending he doesn't know that Jonathan knows what he is. At one point, Jonathan does try to escape, just like straight out the front door, uh, trying not to reveal that he knows what Dracula is, but tries to like force Dracula's hand a little bit because Dracula still kind of needs him. Um, so Dracula's pretending he doesn't know, and it's, it's great. Uh, he's hoping to convince the Count to let him go. Uh, it's been such a lovely visit. You've been great, but I, I gotta get home, you know? Uh, no, don't worry about my bags, uh, or the fact that it's pitch black outside, or the fact that there's no carriage, so I would have to walk for miles and miles to get to the next town. No, 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 just, just, it's fine, it's fine, no worries, Cal, just, just, uh, let me leave. Just open the door and let me leave. It's, it's fine. I've got no problems with that. And the Count is like, if that's how you feel. And he smiles as he opens the unopenable front door very slowly. And Jonathan can hear the wolves howling coming closer and closer. All the while, the Count is watching him smiling and it's a game of chicken until eventually Jonathan's like, No, please, no, close the door. I'll stay. I'll stay. Now, he does manage to eventually escape, and he ends up being fine, ultimately. Uh, there is at least one window that he can climb out of, but it is so high that he has to climb down the sheer castle wall, which was a last resort, because, you know, plummeting to your death, not, not pleasant. Uh, but upon the Count leaving, and thus leaving Harker in the hands of the brides, who will kill him by nightfall, Harker has to take that chance, and he does. Now, most of that stuff is towards the beginning of the book, and from then on, Dracula is either mentioned, or we see him passing what his actions are. Like, taking weeks to kill Lucy, a friend of Mina Harker, who is Jonathan Harker's wife, uh, before she ultimately dies and becomes a vampire. Lucky her. Uh, he isn't really shown directly, except for maybe one brief glance by Mina, who doesn't catch much, and when she does catch something, she waves it off as like a, a trick or an illusion because she's so tired. Uh, we see Lucy fading. We see all this efforts to save her life by no less than four men giving blood from their veins, some of them repeatedly. They put up garlic and they put up crosses, all to no avail because either someone removes them because they're stupid, or Dracula finds a way around them, one of which was really cool because he utilized a wolf. But we don't really see Dracula. So I know, why does he want Lucy as a vampire? I'm not sure. I think Van Helsing says it gives him a servant and a place to stay because he could maybe sleep in Lucy's crypt because he created her. But he never goes after her again, and it makes little sense for him to drink only from her over the course of a few weeks when we have seen that he has outright killed over a dozen men on a ship. The ship that took him from Transylvania to England. He killed so many men. But yet he only focuses on this one chick once he lands on the... Is it because she's hot? Now because Dracula has done such a horrible thing to Lucy, made her all sexy rather than modest, because fangs make you horny, and she just starts flirting with everybody once she gets them. Uh, and being a horny woman in Victorian times is a big no-no. Uh, and, okay, this one, uh, yeah, she gets bloodthirsty and she starts luring children to her graveyard and she drinks from them. Uh, she doesn't hurt them, not really. Like, uh, she just takes, like, a little nibble. None of them get killed, none of them get turned. 
In that situation, why not just live and let live? She's not really killing anybody. The kids are fine. Some of them even made a game out of it. You know, oh, the, the blue for lady. I don't know what that's supposed to mean, but that's what they call her. And then the men that love her have to go and stake her in the heart and cut off her head so as to, if not save her life, they can save her soul. But because Dracula contributed to all of that in the first place, shocker, he's gonna die. He even attacks Mina Harker when everyone thinks they've gotten the upper hand. Attacks her right in her bedroom mesmerizing her and paralyzing Jonathan, who had been right next to her, so he cannot help. He can't move. He can't do anything. He is just completely unconscious. She is mesmerized. And then he forces her to drink some of his blood. If Mina dies at any point before Dracula is killed, well then, only her soul, not her life, can be saved by that point, just like Lucy. The reason he attacks Mina is to get back at the foolish mortals that have been finding all his hideouts and then sanctifying with holy water and holy wafers all but three of his boxes of earth, thus forcing him to f run back to Transylvania. Then it becomes a big race against time and they have to hunt him down. It's a big showdown and there are some deaths that occur, but eventually Dracula is killed and almost everyone is left alive. What I will give this story is that it is interesting. It has great scenes of murder and macabre. You get a real sense of peril, as there are a good number of victims, and there are plenty of characters, by the way, that I did not go into, like Renfield. But why spoil everything? There are mysterious elements that unfold as you read. Like in Carmilla, the characters don't know the extent of what is going on until it's almost too late. Whereas the reader, us, we're fully like, nah, don't go in there, that's stupid. Me, I'm the one in the shadows going, yes, come, come, dumb one. For the most part, it's a good classic to pick up. Even if, once again, the vampire dies. Yeah, there are no children of the night out here. I'm not cool enough for wolves.